Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. Healthcare 2019, what's happening? What, where is the development? Where do we see growth? We've seen really growth in this small little hospital that used to just be a standalone hospital on 30th Street or 31st Street and 1st Avenue. Today, the NYU Langone Health is one of the largest healthcare systems in the East and around the country. And today, I'm, I have the benefit of having two of their senior professionals to talk about the growth and development of the NYU Langone Health. My guests today include Dr. Andy Brotman, who is the Senior Vice President, Vice Dean, Clinical Affairs, External Affairs at the NYU Langone Health. And the other Andy, Andy Rubin, who is the Vice President for Ambulatory Care and Clinical Health Activities at NYU. So 1999, this guy came from Boston. So what have you seen over the last 20 years? And where do you see the growth changing in 2019? Well, back in uh, 1999, uh, NYU and most of the other places were, were predominantly uh, uh, hospitals where private practitioners would uh, practice. And the big move since uh, that time has been the formation of large employed physician groups and the movement of activity from hospitals to ambulatory care sites and offices and the growth of groups that used to be small into larger groups so that they can uh, have some economies of scale and deal with all the compliance issues and the laws and the quality metrics and the electronics that have been uh, foisted upon them. How have you seen the ambulatory growth from 1999 over the last 20 years? How many ambulatory centers do we have now? How many doctors, how many, you know, and what's going on with the transition, because you have a major transition taking place in August with the Winthrop, NYU Winthrop. So we started when uh, Andy came to New York, we started with about 200 physicians in just a couple locations in the main campus. And those were predominantly practices or specialties that were hospital-based and uh, really couldn't survive on their own outside of a hospital system. Uh, today we have about 3,000 physicians, 350 locations, close to 8,000. Uh, staff and physicians working in those locations. So we've seen obviously uh, enormous growth as uh, these physician groups uh, and private practices have gravitated towards uh, a larger medical group. How have the physicians accepted the change, okay? 
Today, many of the physicians are employed by the hospital. How do you retain and how do you build the practice? So, for people who are 50 or over, it's been a really difficult 20 years. It's changed rather markedly from being in your office, coming to the hospital at seven o'clock in the morning, rounding on your patients, coming back again at seven o'clock at night. Uh, today, it's really not like that. There are hospitalists who take care of your patients during the day. If you're an obstetrician, there are safety officers there 24-7 looking over your shoulder. Uh, the uh, demands for safety are much higher. Uh, the quality metrics uh, are much uh, fiercer. Everything is electronic, and therefore there's a lot more uh, documentation. You, you know, when you talk about the electronic, I think part of the, the pro is you have the information on the electronics. The con is that you don't see your doctor because the doctor is spending time inputting and checking the records as opposed to looking at the Yes, patient. so we've had this uh, situation that happened under the Obama uh, administration where there was a, a fairly significant financial incentive to uh, moving to an electronic medical record and most people uh, took advantage of that and uh, we did. We now have uh, at least 8,000 doctors on an electronic medical record and uh, 20,000 nurses, PAs, etc. And uh, uh, our challenge now is to try to optimize that so that it doesn't, in fact, interfere with the doctor-patient relationship so that people aren't treating the computer rather than treating the patient. And, and the typical physician spending at least an hour up to two hours a day more seeing the same number of patients, you know, working on this electronic medical record. The patients love it. They can get information you know, much easier than they used to, and they can make appointments. The pity but, uh, is, you know, they're getting information and they're getting the, the test results. So we, we were charged with developing a policy on when to release results to patients. And some doctors said, I don't want you to release it until I review it and I call my patient. I don't want any patient receiving results until I've had an opportunity to talk to them. The problem is, and the, the dirty little secret is, that there's a substantial percentage who don't review the results and don't get in touch with the patient in a reasonable period of time. And in fact, it's the patient's information and they have a right to it. So we decided that in 72 hours, we, no matter what, no matter what, we were going to release the uh, information, realizing exactly what you said, that some people may get it cold uh, and say, what's this number? And that will then, frankly, force a conversation with the physician or the uh, nurse practitioner. But we felt that it was more important for patients to reliably get their information 100% of the time than a hit and miss situation. Now, if it's, a, if it's an x-ray that shows a tumor or something like that, we hold that back. But for uh, almost all blood tests, uh, we release that information. And let's talk about Winthrop what happened in the new medical school, the circumstances and what's going on and what, what will change in, a, in August. So I'll talk a little about Winthrop because it's a different experience for us. Winthrop is a rather large regional hospital with uh, 560 uh, beds out in Mineola uh, that has had a good reputation for many years and previously had a relationship, uh, a loose relationship with New York Presbyterian. As the world uh, began to consolidate, they began to look for a partner, uh, and uh, it turned out that uh, we thought that our philosophy and their philosophy were very consistent, and in a rather short period of time, we made an agreement to uh, get together. Our model of getting together is a full asset merger. And so we will have a full asset merger in August. Uh, uh, we made an affiliation agreement about a year ago. And as such, we're the so-called uh, uh, active parent uh, of the organization. In August, the hospital becomes NYU Langone Medical Center. It'll still be known as NYU uh, Langone Winthrop, but it will be the same tax ID and the same uh, hospital as uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn. And the doctors who work there, who are part the doctors who are part of their physician group, will be part of into the our group this past January. So that the physician group has already become part of so the how, NYU Langone Health Group. How do you get group. a suburban group 
or suburban doctors who have a different personality and a different nomenclature and how they operate to be part of a New York City-based group? We were pretty fortunate. We already had several hundred physicians on Long Island as part of the NYU Langone Health existing physician group. So we already had a lot of sites and familiarity with the market and the culture on the island. So naturally putting any groups together is a lot of work. Uh, the, the management team that ran the group is, is still in place and still working with us closely. So we're, we're moving slowly. The big piece that you sort of have to do right away, which we did, was put them onto EPIC, our electronic medical record. And now that we're all in one system, one set of financials, one clinical system, we can start putting our uh, sort of our uh, you know face on the practices and integrating them with whether it be technology or or resources. But I will say that that there are a lot of leaders uh, out there, department chairs, uh, very productive clinicians, who left traditional academic medical centers in order to be in an environment that they felt to be a little less obtrusive than that environment. So, and then they turn around and say, here we go again. We're, we're, we're back to where we were. And so uh, our job is to, is to try to uh, uh, say, yes, this is an academic medical center. But if you've seen one, you've seen one. And we're going to tr try to create an environment within uh, the boundaries of what we see as safe and ethical and, uh, and high quality uh, uh, so that you can continue to operate uh, uh, as you have. Okay, you have this physician group who's operating autonomously. Okay, now you say to them, you want to be part of the group, you have to follow our procedures, you have to follow our revenue models, you know, you can't control what you're earning yourself and making the de determination yourself. How, that's one problem. How do you get the doctors to also leave their facilities, of which many of them may have owned the buildings, because a lot of suburban people have their ownership, and put them in a larger ambulatory, because that's the mantra today of the NYU Langone right. system. So you have to work through each one of those cases individually. There aren't uh, commonalities. Uh, people who own their property, if they happen to have a property which is leasable or sellable, uh, they, will, uh, they will do that. And some, in fact, will find that to be a profitable venture. There are some who just won't move because of that uh, issue. But we create contracts for these individuals. Uh, they don't join us. Uh, to do worse than they have done before. They join us for either more security or to do better. And with each one, we create a uh, contract uh, with parameters in it uh, uh, so that they know what they're getting into. And, uh, uh, but they're one by one. It isn't a blanket statement. Now, what happens to, with regard to, you know, the cancer centers? Yes. Yeah. Winthrop has their own cancer yeah. center. NYU has the promoter yeah. and yeah. NCI. So I'm, I'm, mani I'm managing that right now. And uh, because we are merging, that cancer center will become a, a part of the Perlmutter Cancer Center, an NCI designated cancer center. And so that cancer center will have to use uh, uh, similar protocols. All the doctors are meeting together. All their disease groups are meeting together. Clinical trials will be shared. Uh, there will be some uh, uh, differences in what it feels like in Mineola versus what it feels like in Manhattan, and the local management will be different, but the broad strokes uh, in something like that have to be more homogenized uh, because of the NCI cancer designation. What's the change in the calculation for the patient on what they're going to get reimbursed and unreimbursed today? The, the physician group is on, on, we're one group now, so they're on our contracts. And everybody uh, in Long Island and New York has different insurance plans, some with high deductibles, some with low deductibles, some with no deductibles. And we have different rates with different insurers. So each person is, you know, whether it doesn't matter where they live, in, in New York, Long Island, or anywhere in the country, each person's going to experience uh, a different balance on their bill based on, on their insurance product. So, you know, obviously we work with patients who uh, may have problems paying their bills uh, and we'll do the best we can to make sure everybody gets the right health care 
uh, and, and you know, not get stuck with a bill they can't handle. NYU has implemented a telemedicine program and a limited urgent care. Let's talk about that. Uh, we did not get into the urgent care uh, space uh, early enough or rapidly enough uh, to compete uh, against uh, folks like uh, CityMD and others who have uh, uh, really made it a, a would, business. Would have you got into the business, do you believe? No, we, we made the active decision, decision not to go into to, the urgent to, care to, to stay with ambulatory groups rather than that. And then in looking at what the nature of that business was uh, and in, in figuring out that it certainly did not uh, substantially reduce emergency room visits. Uh, people still go to, there hasn't been a decrease in any emergency room visits anywhere. What it's done is create visits that ultimate, that otherwise people might not have gone to, and it's actually decreased doctor visits because it's more convenient to walk into a local urgent care than to try to schedule an appointment for your doctor. So we thought that convenience was the key issue. And uh, we decided to say, how can we be convenient? And the way we decided to do that was through uh, digital technology and to have our emergency physicians uh, board certified uh, 16 hours a day manning a virtual urgent care that can be done on your telephone so you don't even have to put your clothes on. You can do it, uh, you can do it from home. What procedures, what services in general are being utilized for the telemedicine today? So telemedicine is uh, uh, the same thing that people go to urgent care for. Uh, you go if you have uh, upper respiratory disease, you go if you have gastro uh, gastroenteritis, you go if you're, if you're a little sick and you would have got, gone to a doctor's office. Uh, that's what you go for. Isn't psychiatry being done? Psychiatry is a field where there's real shortages in certain areas. So we have a variety of contracts with public entities and private entities to provide psychiatric care in a telemedicine fashion. We also provide it to our various facilities. So if somebody is in a facility that doesn't have psychiatry, we can do telemedicine within in facilities. I, I, you know, out in California, Kaiser says that 40 to 50 percent of their visits are done via telemedicine. The reason for that is they control the payment mechanism and they can decide how to do that. Uh, ours is still in its infancy, uh, but I think it's going to grow dramatically uh, when and if the various payers uh, uh, have different policies to uh, reimburse for tele telehealth. Let, let's talk about uh, Brooklyn, what's happening there, what has happened over the last couple of years and the transition of L the Lutheran system. Brooklyn has been an interesting process, which we think is going to be fundamentally different than uh, the Winthrop process. So when you merge into a single entity, you report all your outcome measures, everything together. And therefore, uh, uh, what, what we value is high quality. And so we follow all the various metrics, length of stay, mortality rate, surgical infections, readmissions, complications, uh, infections, etc., cetera, and uh, uh, put a lot of emphasis on getting all of those things to the same level or better as they were and are in Manhattan. And that has happened so that uh, over the last uh, three years, there's been a dramatic increase in, uh, in quality, uh, uh, but it's come at some cost. So now there's a hospitalist program where there are uh, uh, doctors there 24-7, 365. There are, there are uh, safety officers and uh, OB. Uh, it used to be a place where there were a lot of private staff where, where doctors would come in the morning and at night, as I described earlier, and now they're there all day. The with, nurses with, are fully with trained. With regard to that, are you having your doctors from Manhattan go to Brooklyn? Uh, many have. So at least uh, 30 uh, have moved out and have taken positions of uh, uh, leadership in Brooklyn. We've, we've opened a new building, ambulatory care building, five stories with full imaging, uh, all multi-specialty. We renovated the existing ambulatory uh, care building in, in Bay Ridge. We've opened some new sites uh, in Cobble Hill in downtown Brooklyn that, you know, where the patients now are selecting to go or opting to go to Brooklyn Hospital. We've expanded our residency programs. 
Let's talk about what's happening in Cobble Hill at the old uh, downs, the uh, Lich. Lich, Long, Long Island, Island College. College. Yeah. What are you doing over there? You do Essex. So Essex Crossing, is, it's sort of the east, the east side version of Hudson Yards. It's a big uh, development that's going up in the city, residential. It was 50 years, and nothing happened there. Yeah, right. uh, but now there's a lot of activity down there. So uh, the, one of the first... It's also more convenient than Hudson Yards. <laughs> one of the first residential buildings opened up about a year ago. Uh, many more are under construction now. We took the, the retail space and opened up a four uh, operating room ambulatory surgery center and uh, 20 physician group practice upstairs with physical therapy. So we're staffing that with some of our existing physicians who are working downtown, consolidating them in there, and then adding some new physician and specialties to sort of feed that uh, Lower East Side market, which quite frankly was underserved for a right, very long time. Right, there was time. no real hospital. What's now, happening? Cobble Hill, we've been operating the emergency room out there as a freestanding full emergency room. Uh, since we took it over. When we took it over, they were seeing between five and 10 patients a day. We're now seeing about 80 patients a day. It's become a, a very uh, well-received uh, place. The real estate is far more complicated. A developer named uh, Fortis has the project and they are putting up a uh, uh, Luxury condominium. Yes, in excess of uh, a million square feet or more. Uh, the the uh, project, like many real estate projects, uh, has a time frame that's been somewhat delayed. Uh, we are uh, expecting to have the land given to us within the next couple of and months. And you're going to be building? We're building a 200,000 square foot ambulatory care center there, uh, um, which we think will uh, really add to the community. Let's talk about the new ambulatory care centers, the one on 53rd, the one on uh, 41st Street and 38th Street. So uh, some buildings uh, uh, are hospital licensed and some buildings are not hospital licensed. So Article that, 28? Article 28. So that's one determination. So uh, in order to do surgery or uh, 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 certain other uh, things like chemotherapy infusion, an Article 28 is desirable. The other buildings are physician office buildings. So 53rd Street is not Article 28, 41st Street is not Article 28, 38th Street, uh, uh, one of them is. Uh, uh, so part of it is, uh, is that. Now 53rd Street, we intend to have a uh, women's focus, so uh, reproductive uh, endocrinology, fertility, uh, OBGYN, uh, our women's center, which needs to move sometime in the next five years from the Upper East Side. So that'll have a, a woman's focus. Uh, 38th Street has a uh, uh, an orthopedic focus, and uh, 41st Street was our typical faculty practice, uh, uh, medicine, surgery, neurology. So consolidating a lot of existing sites that have uh, outlived their useful lives. Okay. What about uh, private equity in healthcare? How do you see it? Uh, a lot of private equity invests in single specialty practices. So there's a big company that invests in uh, anesthesia. There's a big company. And big, radiology. And radiology. Dermatology. And, and dermatology oh. and reproductive endocrinology. Uh, but then there are some that are investing in multi-specialty group practices. So those practices that remain independent, that have tried to grow their own infrastructure rather than joining an organization like ours, some go to private equity or some other source of uh, funding and uh, get acquired by them. And, and, and we can't compete on a solid footing. In other words, because we're a nonprofit, uh, uh, we can't compete with a for-profit. They're able to deliver some money uh, uh, under capital gains taxes, where our, our, ours is this, this has been tried many times in the past decades. Uh, the we'll, see if it's is, we'll see if it's different this you, time. You know, it's a difficult thing to do private equity in a healthcare business. So what we say to people is in in a hundred years, we want to practice medicine. Uh, can 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 the folks who are wooing you say that? So how do you see 2020, 21? What's going to be the difference in healthcare at the NYU Langone? Are are you going to expand into New Jersey? Are you going to open up more cancer centers? I think we'll, con we'll continue to uh, uh, grow 
but in our core areas of, uh, of the boroughs, Long Island, uh, Lower Westchester, less likely uh, New Jersey and Connecticut. Right. It would, it would change your signage made in New York. Okay. That's correct. It would be a problem. You'd have to have made in NY, made in New Jersey. Okay. But I, I, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest things that are going to happen in the next two or three years is, uh, and I turn it back over to Andrew because he's the expert on this, is what happens with uh, reimbursement, what happens with, uh, with Medicare, uh, what happens with the consolidation of the health insurance companies and uh, them moving from uh, fee-for-service to value-based service and the impact that do, that has. Do you has. see, with regard to that, due to the high deductibles, do you see certain people not going to the doctors or there's a change? I think less of that. I think you'll see more narrow networks which are defined as uh, less choice for patients. So you'll be able to see a doctor within a, a more limited network where insurance companies have negotiated favored pricing uh, to keep people within that narrow network. So taking similar some of the choice away. Similar to the Oscar away, concept? Yes. 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 Okay. Similar to the answer. I do yes. see shoring up uh, the Obamacare plans. I do see fixes for that on the horizon. Okay. New York will always be the healthcare capital of the world. A little different because we have so much competition. Uh, when you talk to colleagues around the country, the environments are so completely different because many of them are the dominant player in their environment. And here, every corner has an academic medical And center. that's why it's really good for the NYU Langone to, ha to have the 20-year veterans remaining continue to work there. I'd like to thank Andy Brockman and Andy Rubin, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.